So let's uh, get into it. So I'm from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So uh, Berkeley Lab is uh, located on the hill above the UC Berkeley campus. So this is a view uh, from our lab. When you actually look the other direction from uh, on Berkeley campus and you look up the hill, you'll see this giant dome up there. And that's our cyclotron. And that was you know, what Berkeley Lab was originally uh, the world's first atom smasher was developed up there in the hill. And so we are founded as a uh, uh, multidisciplinary big science research lab in physics, but we've now diversified into many other fields. Um, I am department head for computing science in the uh, 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 CS division of, uh, of Berkeley Lab. Uh, computing sciences includes uh, uh, NERSC, which is a supercomputing center, uh, ESNet, which is the Department of Energy's uh, national uh, high performance network. Uh, it also operates the 100 gigabit uh, network for uh, jointly with um, uh, Internet 2. So the backbone for uh, the United States is operated uh, uh, with ESNet in cooperation with, uh, with Internet 2. Uh, and then we have our computational research division. So I'm CTO at NERSC, uh, but I am department head for computer science in the computational research division, which includes applied math, computer science and computational science, which is the big HPC applications. And you know, the, the, the current driving uh, 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 research missions, the things that are really pushing our uh, uh, this computing science division is, number one, how can we continue to improve the performance of supercomputing systems uh, well, by reducing the amount of energy required per operation. Uh, the past 30 years, it's been uh, Moore's Law and Denard Scaling have given this to us on a silver platter, exponential improvements in performance and energy efficiency for 30 years. But that has ended. So this means that uh, computer architecture has to change in order to get further improvements in performance, and that will have consequences for the software and the way, manner in which we program these machines. The second is what kinds of mathematical models, algorithms, and software are needed for increasingly complicated uh, multi-physics codes, models, simulations that we perform, which is kind of our bread and butter of uh, HPC operations. And also, can we enable new mo modes of scientific discovery by applying advanced computing and networking, uh, not just to the models, which has been the traditional place for HPC, but actually to also data that comes from very large terrestrial experiments. Um, you know, DOE is known for its HPC, but the other part of DOE is known for operating the largest big science experiments in the planet. And operating these experiments like the atom smashers and the uh, sky surveys uh, has led uh, to 135 Nobel Prizes that where DOE was the lead in creating the experiment uh, that, that led to those Nobel Prizes. And there's a data explosion from these experiments where there's a double exponential growth rate in the rate at which uh, in the resolution of data that we're able to gather from those experiments. And now it takes supercomputers just to process the data from these experiments in addition to the traditional role of supercomputers for running computational models. But you need both, uh, and both need to come together for science to really happen. So this is a aerial view of our lab. This is building 50 where uh, computing sciences and physics uh, resides, but it's a very, very large campus. And if you ever look up the hill too, you'll see that there's a ginormous building being constructed there. And that is the new facility for NERSC. Uh, so NERSC is the National Energy Sciences Computing Center. Uh, it is, uh, does all of the computing for DOE's Office of Science. So DOE actually has two, two halves. You have the NNSA, which is the National Nuclear Safety Administration. Used to, <laughs> used to not be a part of DOE, but Jimmy Carter put it all together. Uh, and NNSA is the, um, uh, well, they design bombs, uh, <laughs> to, to be frank. And that's, the, that's a different part. <laughs> 
That's a different part of the, the DOE. Um, we're the Office of Science. So the Office of Science does all the basic sciences. We do climate modeling, uh, development of new materials, uh, astrophysics, cosmology. All of the basic sciences happen in the Office of Science side. And NERSC was uh, in fusion. That was actually, we were originally the fusion computing center. Uh, and so NERSC is actually the only supercomputing center um, uh, that's responsible for uh, serving all of the areas of science, for unclassified areas of science in the Office of Science. Um, there are other uh, centers, there's the leadership facilities at Oak Ridge and Argonne, uh, but those facilities aren't responsible for the Office of Science. They're actually national facilities, meaning that they serve anybody who says that they can scale to the large machine and they don't have a responsibility to the science areas of DOE. So um, this new building here is uh, currently provisioned for 12 and a half megawatts, but scalable to 42 megawatts. Uh, we have a lot of uh, power on the hill because of our past large experiments. Uh, and uh, the water, it, it's um, hydroelectric power, uh, and so it's only five cents per kilowatt hour, which is about the lowest uh, cost energy that you can get in the United States. And for energy efficiency purposes, it uses free air cooling. So these large vents here, we, we determined that the, uh, uh, the Bay Area air is pretty uniform in temperature throughout the year. So most of the year, you can actually just take in Bay Area air and blow it through the machines and cool them down. And you never have to use a chiller. Uh, and so it makes for uh, extremely uh, uh, good power uh, energy efficiency. So PUE is 1.1. 1.0 would mean that is, is the power of the machine. And so it only takes 0.1 extra power just for the fan motors for cooling. So we, we waste very, very little electricity uh, on cooling. What is it right now? Uh, 1.3 for our current building in Oakland. Um, which isn't bad actually, but that took a lot of years of design work. So, um, and this is kind of a view of our systems, and I think this is kind of boring. We, you know, our two primary systems now are Edison, which is a Cray XC30. Uh, this is actually the culmination of DARPA's HPCS effort. Uh, uh, NERSC uh, uh, got the very num serial number zero prototype machine from Cray in, in DARPA uh, for the, uh, this, this eight-year DARPA HPCS program. And now we've scaled it up to a full production system. And then we have Hopper, which is our older generation system. We always keep two uh, machines and uh, supercomputers in the floor at any given time so that one could be down for maintenance and the other still up for business. And we also have a large global shared uh, parallel file system uh, that's in the order of uh, five petabytes that uh, we can use to serve all of our large projects. And the local scratch is like uh, 7.6 petabytes. Very large bandwidth. So, um, so, so why, why do we need to operate such large facilities, such large systems? Um, so one example is combustion or creating more energy efficient combustion systems. Uh, it turns out that even with all of the conversion to electricity, electrical power, all these things, uh, uh, to improve our energy efficiency, 85% of the energy in the United States comes from burning things, period. So one thing you can do is conserve energy, but there's only so far you can push that. The other thing that you can do is improve your energy efficiency of combustion devices. So high-end modeling for combustion devices for this is like a, a fuel injector assembly uh, for a future diesel uh, system uh, requires the largest machines you know on the planet. Uh, the first thing that you have is direct numerical simulation of turbulence uh, we call DNS and this requires a uh, 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 couple of petaflop, one of the largest machines around for uh, <clears throat> just to do three by three by three millimeters cubed um, uh, of, of uh, the combustion phenomenon. And you use that direct numerical simulation in order to calibrate uh, what happens inside of each of these cells for what we call a large eddy simulation uh, type simulation. 
this one, three, three millimeters cubed, will not do a full injector assembly. So you take information from this simulation, you feed it to the large eddy simulation, which can do the entire injector assembly. And this also is, requires the largest machines in the planet. And yet, we're only simulating a tiny injector assembly. Things are a lot more complicated than that. So the, the steady march, this exponential growth in computational performance has enabled us to move from toy laboratory flames up to simulating injectors and devices like that where we are now. And where we want to go to is full device simulation so that you can design the energy efficient diesel combustion system of the future. Um, and you know, right now you can barely do ignition events inside of the cylinder. Um, uh, supercomputing is a lot less expensive than uh, going to the machine shop and creating a thousand variants of a uh, cylinder design for a diesel engine. Instead, you simulate a thousand variants and then you pick your fi top five candidates. And that's a much more efficient way to design uh, future combustion systems. So then, um, uh, this just now, now we're getting into the main part of the presentation, which is uh, the alignment between what we need to support our mission as a supercomputing center and our ability to support those science and advanced engineering design on supercomputers and how that converges with application performance you know, in the cloud. Um, uh, uh, the, the cloud I'm going to use as a proxy for the warehouse scale computing centers, which thus far have been said to be very divergent from, from, from our HPC requirements. Um, uh, and so we'll evaluate uh, what the drivers were that led them to be completely different from our needs and why those things have actually turned around and we actually see things being very convergent now. Um, so let me just skip straight into it. So we're going to talk about the application performance. We did a performance study in the cloud of current Amazon clouds and, and found that there are issues with being able to use that infrastructure. Uh, we use similar CPUs, similar servers. So the server blades that they use in the cloud, very similar to us. It's the HPC fabric requirements where we see the divergence. Um, however, in talking to, uh, I, I for, had the, the fortune to, uh, um, uh, to lead uh, a couple of uh, the uh, IEEE's uh, optical interconnect conferences. So I was the, the, the general chair for a series of conferences for uh, IEEE on uh, optical interconnects. And I got to meet a lot of people from Google and from, uh, uh, from Facebook. And we actually, upon better understanding what each other's issues are. I, there's now the drivers have changed because of the data mining that they do in those spaces. And we think that there's a lot of opportunity for converged requirements and maybe more commonality in the fabrics. And so we'll talk about uh, what the implications are of that. So first part is measuring the cloud value proposition. And I warn you, this study was done starting in 2009. And things have changed dramatically since 2009. Um, in 2009, a lot of these clusters were lashed together with gigabit ethernet. And you have virtual machines uh, that uh, sitting on top of your CPUs and the VMs at the time, not so great. Uh, so, you know, the performance uh, barometer uh, that we use to evaluate the effectiveness of the cloud are a set of applications that we refer to as the sustained system performance application suite. It's derived from our application workload. And, um, and, and we use this to evaluate whether or not clouds, it, it was more cost effective for NERSC to not acquire new machines and, in fact, rent time from Amazon. Because uh, the, the theory was at the time that, um, that they have even more resources than we do and that because of the volume that it would be a lot more cost effective. Um, so massively parallel COTS x86 nodes, but the divergence in the requirements were that the cloud was really designed uh, for externally facing TCP IP standards based fabrics and HPC was primarily designed with internally facing high performance and custom uh, interconnect fabrics. Uh, this got um, misplaced. Uh, so let's just talk about the DOE workload. So um, 
we have about 3,000, actually we don't have 3,000 users, we have 6,000 users. Um, the, and those users represent 300 to 400 projects. Uh, and the projects uh, have a lot of code, so it's 500 to 700 different codes are represented. And Office of Science is comprised of 15 uh, science areas. But in order to make this tractable, we have to plow through that workload and select something tractable, less than 10 codes to represent the requirements of that workload. Uh, and we'd like to cover both the application space and the algorithm space um, to, to ensure that we don't leave anything out that's important for HPC performance. This is a breakdown of the current users that we have at the, uh, uh, at the NERSC Center um, and Office of Science. Uh, this is an older slide here, again, 2009. Fusion energy was dominant, but now uh, uh, climate research and uh, material science are the dominant parts of the workload. But, you know, we'll focus on these red circles here. These are the biggest contributors to our workload. Um, the, uh, in terms of algorithm diversity, uh, these are the different science areas that I referred to earlier, and they have uh, a, a finite set of numerical methods, actually, that are really uh, important. And this is just in general, uh, Phil Colella had this notion of the seven dwarfs. So we have Phil Colella, seven dwarfs. And uh, 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 we inadvertently popularized this by uh, telling David Patterson at Berkeley about this. And so then he got more excited than, than Phil was about his seven dwarfs. But, uh, so I, I would credit Dave for popularizing Phil's idea. Uh, and uh, so you have dense linear algebra, sparse linear algebra, spectral methods with FFTs, particle-based methods, structured grids, and unstructured grids. Um, we throw in, in AMR there. Uh, and that, that's the diversity of algorithms. And so what we did was we uh, found the dominant codes in each of these sub areas uh, um, and, and, uh, and made sure that we actually had coverage here for both uh, each of the science areas, but also made sure that we had diverse coverage of each of the algorithms. And this is the way that you, and then we take those codes and we actually created a summary metric which was the geome uh, the um, uh, was it the geometric mean or the harmonic mean? Um, well, we basically amalgamated the performance across all of these codes to to represent a metric for the fitness or the usefulness of the system. And this is far superior to using spec because spec codes aren't really HPC; they don't run parallel across a large distributed memory system, and it's way better than LinPack, which measures flops. So this this is, I think, a really solid fitness metric because it's really a workload derived from what we're really running on our supercomputers. So when we ran this in the cloud and a number of other clusters, so let me give you the clusters here. Um, the, again, old study, so Franklin was our Cray system at the time, so it has a custom interconnect but an older generation processor. Carver is a cluster that had a modern processor core, Nahalem processor core, but it had InfiniBand interconnect. And then you have uh, Laurentium, which is a, uh, a less expensive commodity cluster, so no virtualization, but a uh, gigabit ethernet type interconnect between the nodes. And then we had the Amazon EC2, and because the low instance in the EC2 was really pitiful, we chose the high instance uh, for the performance comparison. So we got the highest performing node that you could get rent out of EC2. And if you look at the rate, uh, we, um, uh, uh, the performance that we could get from each of these architectures, you know, EC2 uh, is pretty far behind. We normalized, I think, to Carver. We normalized to Carver? No, I guess we didn't normalize to Carver. What did we normalize to? Oh, no, gigaflops per core. Okay, yeah, okay. So this is not normalized here. Um, so, so you can see that um, uh, you know Carver was the fastest. It had the newest processor in it and an okay fabric, uh, but and and uh, but but as you go down the list here, you know we see really pretty bad performance for the um, uh, for the EC2 system. And when we looked at the sustained system performance, which is our amalgamated metric. Um, 
the, uh, and this is uh, virtual teraflops per second, you know, the EC2 was doing pretty, pretty badly, yeah. This is It's the high instance of the older version of EC2, but it was being compared against its contemporaries. This is 2009. So I said, that, as I pointed out, this is the older EC2, and things have changed since then. One of the things they said, it's a blog by a control, that all the benchmarks within the old instances are not valid. You have to try. I, I know it's low enough, but when you go with it, what you have there, but maybe less low. Well, we, we, again, th there's a variety of instances available, and we chose the instance that gave us the best performance out of any that they would offer us. This is a snapshot in time. It is a snapshot in time for 2009, and that's why I bring up the fact that this was done in 2009. Yeah. So we've got five years of evolution since then before we get to that. Yep, but there's still some challenges. I'm going to ask you at least 28 different types of Sure. Right. So we actually went through initially and did an initial pass in the instances to find out which one offered the best performance for our benchmarks. And we chose the instance that offered the best performance because we worried that people would think we were sandbagging Amazon for choosing a lame instance, which is very easy to do. Okay, but that was five years ago. Again, five years ago. True. Yep, that's right. But uh, in fact, the fabric again, uh, the performance of the core, uh, this, this instance had a very powerful core. The issue was not the core, though, it was the fabric. And we'll talk about what's converged in the fabric. They have much more capable fabrics now in the uh, Amazon, uh, but there are still some issues with the way that they allocate resources in Amazon that I don't think ultimately their business model doesn't offer incentive to overcome them. Uh, and, but it may be that, that the HPC people need to overcome it. Uh, <clears throat> all of these benchmarks actually run across multiple instances, and your point is the connection is actually. Correct. This is, and this is pretty small, though. You know, so we only did 256 instances, uh, which is really in the low end for what we need. And um, uh, so we'd want to scale some more. But it gives you enough of a, a picture of what the performance challenges are. First thing that happened, certainly, when I first got on the Amazon Cloud was that uh, open MPI wouldn't work. Well, first thing is you get shocked. You get on the Amazon Cloud, and you're like, oh, wow, I'm root on a node somewhere. And they're like, oh, crud, I'm root on something. Now I got to install all the software. And so you have to go in there and install MPI and, and NFS and, and, and all the stuff you need for the HPC stuff. And then open MPI wouldn't work. And I couldn't figure out why. And I sent the error code to the open MPI developers. They said, well, you, that's because you're an idiot. All of your nodes are in different subnets. Who would, who would construct a cluster like that? <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and so we had to patch OpenMPI so that it could handle nodes that were on different subnets. Uh, and, and we were unable, and we still have issues with, some, if you're lucky, you'll get all nodes that are in the same subnet. But now normally, yeah, and now, and now you can. But you know, at that time, we, 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 had even, we didn't even know if we were in the same state. We weren't really sure. <laughs> uh, so uh, anyways, uh, you can see more clearly uh, the, that, that we've implicated the network and the performance because uh, here you have the percent of the time spent in communication along this axis here. And the codes that really hammer the interconnect are the ones that fall off that, that you know, relative to Lorentzium, which is our own you know, cluster, uh, the ones that, that, that see the biggest performance hit uh, that are much slower than Lorentzium are the ones that communicate the most. So uh, clearly the issue is, is, is the fabric here uh, and not, not the instance of the node that we chose. Um, uh, the other thing though, that we observed in the cloud, which is problematic, and I don't know if there's any incentive. Uh, we, we saw uh, with the VM images that we had at the time, there was a lot of compute variability observed, but the communication variability was particularly uh, uh, sizable. 
Um, and, and that for bulk synchronous code, so most of the HPC apps, we actually go through great pains to quiesce any sources of non-uniformity or noise in our systems. Uh, now, there is a lot of concern in the HPC community that that's no longer practical to do as we move forward. Uh, and the debate right now is, can we continue to do bulk synchronous programming model where threads compute and then they hit a barrier, they exchange information, and then they compute again. If you have load imbalances, then that just completely breaks that model. Uh, the cloud doesn't give a crap, doesn't care, you know, but, but our apps are very sensitive to that. And, uh, and, and so this, this, this constitutes a problem, performance problem too. Uh, yeah, to topological compactness. So the observation, and again, I, I agree with you. That's the reason why in each of these slides I like to qualify it with in 2009 uh, is that we saw significantly lower interconnect performance. And it was, uh, the, there were high overheads due to virtualization. Uh, and the, and uh, the TCP overheads were very apparent to us because of the way that virtualization was done at the time. Uh, low effective bandwidth compared to InfiniBand or the custom in, uh, interconnects uh, and substantial performance variability. Uh, the instances that we had access to at the time uh, had stacking of uh, VMs. So you'd have, you could, might be, your VM might be sharing a node with somebody else you wouldn't really know. Um, and uh, uh, expensive use of, uh, and if you wanted to use unvirtualized hardware, it was a very expensive instance, and, and we did that too. But that hardware is also virtualized. You just are guaranteed that nobody else is sharing uh, that the host process, the host OS with you, uh, that your guest OS is the only one on it. But we still saw a lot of issues with that. Uh, we also observed a really high mean time between failure. So we encountered a lot of VM failures in, in our uh, studies. And so that, that was uh, uh, also uh, trouble. We had boot failures and, um, uh, uh, and, and machines would just wink in and out of existence. So the bottom line was that the cost to operate our HPC centers 50 million a year. The cost to operate an equivalent size system in the cloud at the time was about, um, uh, and this is just based on Linpack, which doesn't do communication, so no fabric, just the instances for the flops, uh, was about 200 million a year. And the cost to operate an equivalent performance facility running our actual workload was on the order of 1 billion per year. And that's just for the not very scaled up jobs. Uh, so that, that told us basically, yeah, we probably should acquire our next system. Uh, that being said, things have changed. So let's go over the drivers, the hardware drivers for the clouds and, and where they were, but where they might be going. So the first is that you talk to cloud people in the 2009 time frame, and they were saying that we need to do off-the-shelf Ethernet gear. You know, so if you went to the Hot Interconnects conference, they were all talking about tow engines, but it was all about it has to be COTS Ethernet. Um, HPC, on the other hand, uh, year, years ago determined that the, the interconnect is really crucial for performance. So the area where we had push all of our innovation, we quit innovating in the CPUs. We quit innovating in the memory subsystem. All of our innovation chips are put into the interconnect fa fabric. And if you look at the Cray systems, all custom interconnects, uh, even InfiniBand is kind of semi-custom. Internal versus external, the design strategy for Amazon at the time was to serve internet storefronts. And so it was the architecture of the, the racks and the way that they wired everything up is primarily for externally facing TCP connections for the internet, for web services. Uh, and even when you talk to um, you know, Facebook, to some extent Google, they had MapReduce, but it was still uh, a lot of their trunk line design and stuff was for uh, 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 in, uh, externally facing traffic. And HPC is the other way around. We have pretty large, substantial connections to ES, ESnet, but the amount of bisection bandwidth that we have internally is um, as large on um, one of our machines is as large as the bisection bandwidth of the entire global internet. 
we move more bytes per day in an average supercomputer. Actually, our system today moves more bytes per day than the entire internet does on the same day. Um, so uh, so that, that changes your design point for the interconnect. I'll, I have a slide for that, but I'll get to it because I can't. I thought it was supposed to be the next slide, and I'm looking at what the next slide is, and it isn't. But it is in the slide deck. Uh, so there's actually Google um, uh, does a, a lot of uh, Cisco uh, uh, tracks uh, using its router infrastructure and stuff. What the estimated total amount of traffic there is in the entire internet, uh, and so they and so we use that figure, and then we translated it back to the measured figures that we have in our own system. And uh, the total amount of internal bandwidth that we have in our system is in the order of um, eight times the, the provision bandwidth for the internet. Um, so, you know, the other thing was throughput versus overhead. Uh, if you're designing for TCP, your target is throughput. You're trying to improve download speeds, video feeds, things like that. Uh, for our applications, HPC is really sensitive to latencies. Um, that's one of the uh, big limiting factors. You need to send the smallest messages at full line rate, and, and that's a big challenge. You have to push your overheads to as low as you can. Um, uh, throughput versus overhead. Yeah, stacked VMs for elasticity and contention. Um, uh, the the you know design. If you look at the architecture of uh, uh, the interconnects for a lot of these uh, warehouse scale computing, they're provisioned for kind of loosely coupled random traffic, ephemeral events that are unpredictable. Uh, in HPC, actually, because of that bulk synchronous model. Uh, we have very patterned traffic. So uh, when you hit the communication phase, suddenly everybody does a flood of messages and they do them to a, a, a very well-defined pattern of endpoints. The, the interconnect design, the, the adaptive routing for that is very different than what you would do for a, a warehouse scale uh, computing facility. But during, in 2010 and 2000, uh, 2009, 10 and 11, I, I, so I was on the committee in 2009 for the IEEE Optical Interconnects Conference, and I became technical program chair in 10 and, and then general chair in 11. So I, oh, no, no, I guess it was 11, 12, and 13. Uh, 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 I got to invite these really interesting people from Google and from Facebook. Uh, so we'd have one HPC guy to say what the HPC people need for optical interconnects technology. And then we'd bring in the uh, warehouse scale computing people. And in the first year I was involved, which was 2009, they were saying pretty different things about what they needed. Uh, by 2012, though, we had this guy, Bakash Kohli from Google. And he said, actually, these days, when it's different than it used to be, 80% of Google traffic is now internally facing. Um, <clears throat> it used to be the other way around. So that's kind of surprising. It looks more like HPC. Then you have uh, Dennis Apts um, from Google. He used to be an interconnect architect at Cray, uh, but now he works at Google. And uh, he wrote a book, actually, which was really pretty cool, which was a high performance data center networks, architectures, algorithms, and opportunities. And the opportunities part, he actually started pointing to the fact that uh, with things moving to be more internally facing, uh, there might there, there is actually an opportunity for Cray and Google to start talking with each other uh, because because now it's more similar. Then the the the, the last guy I brought in was Nathan Farrington from uh, Facebook, so he's one of their uh, uh, interconnect architects, and in, he said in 2013 that every kilobyte of external traffic entering Facebook can generate up to 930 kilobytes of internal traffic. This traffic is the data mining, the big data, the finding things from your social networks that has become the big data thing that everybody's talking about these days. So this is a, a slide that Nathan presented. Uh, Bakash wouldn't share his slides with me, but Nathan was kind enough to share uh, his slides. This is HTTP request amplification. And it basically says, 
a, a uh, packet enters the front door, and then this is all of the events that occur in response to one packet entering the front door of Facebook, a kilobyte packet. Um, and so it generates a huge amount of internal traffic. In fact, so much that uh, this is the uh, backbone traffic, is this little teeny blue strip down here. Uh, and this traffic here is now the intercluster traffic. And then these bands up here are the interact traffic. This traffic profile looks a hell of a lot more like HPC traffic profile than I've ever seen from prior presentations from warehouse scale computing people. And this is all attributable to the explosion of the value of, of trying to do big data here. Yeah. But, but the distinction here would be that most of this is speculative and not time sensitive, whereas your traffic, because of the yes. is very time sensitive. We'll, we'll get back to that. So this is throughput, but it's not addressing the latency issues. Yep. So new requirements uh, drive overheads to send a minimum sized message down. So although the arrival time may be delayed, they want, uh, and Nathan, this is a direct quote from Nathan Farrington. He said, I want to send a minimum size packet at full line rate. Uh, so he wants the throughput of minimum size packets to be full line rate. And your off the shelf ethernet gear is not going to do that. Uh, and so that's a new requirement. Um, the other is uh, uh, higher inter data center bandwidth. They've gotten to the point now that the trunk line, the exterior facing network isn't the thing that's holding them back. They are wasting hardware idling, waiting for IO responses in, on their internal network. That means the bandwidth internal needs to crank up. That's really hard to do if you just do off the shelf ethernet gear. Uh, their, their responses have varied, but this is, this is again from things that were said by some of the warehouse scale computing people. They said they're willing to gut the TCP IP stack for their internally facing traffic. Uh, this is something that HPC did years ago. We call it OS bypass. We said that the TCP stack was too heavy. In fact, even involving the OS at all in, in messaging is too heavyweight. We actually have cut through, uh, uh, designed to be safe. There's, so they have MVIA and things like that were designed to bypass the operating system and send messages, get them directly to the network and, and gut a lot of the uh, TCP IP stack. So your ex, you know, TCP IP stack has all these things that are designed for the wide area network, you know, ARPs and, and lookup tables for the Macs. What you need for an internal network is way smaller than that. The stack could be a lot simpler. So the internally facing network doesn't have to run TCP IP. You can have all your IP uh, APIs, but you don't have to run the whole stack inside. Uh, next is pushing towards hardware technology to reduce, uh, to increase bandwidth, sorry, not reduce, increase bandwidth and reduce latencies. So uh, there's, you know, they're starting to show up in force at the uh, hot interconnects conferences and really embracing things like InfiniBand technology and other things like that and push to leaner, more efficient software stacks and definitely the virtualization performance has improved greatly in, in the past few years. Another thing I noticed, there was a, a lot of the HPC people say, why can't we be more like Google? We should use cheap off the shelf white box clusters that we buy from Dell. You know, that would solve the problem. We could be efficient like Google. Turns out actually Google builds its own, it designs it and builds its own boards. They, they do not use cheap ply board computing. So somebody gave a talk called ply board computing and I shared it with somebody from Google and they're like, but we don't do that. You know, we actually do design you know, hardware. But moreover, the surprising thing was that we saw this, this, this is in Wired Magazine, a mysterious box with a switch, an Ethernet switch, and we didn't know what kind of switch, fell off of a truck somewhere in Minnesota. And, and they looked at it, and nobody had ever seen this design for a switch before. So they decided to look at the connectors in the back. Nobody had ever seen connectors like that before. These were not your standard off-the-shelf connectors. Uh, so they said, well, what the hell, we'll boot it up. And well, they had Google firmware. Uh, and, and what it turns out is that Google actually uh, uh, said, you know, this is serious. We're going to do our own switch design. Um, and, and, and 
th this is, uh, uh, shows actually that these issues have gotten so urgent that, that these warehouse scale computing are actually now getting involved in the custom fabric design. So this notion that it's totally the cheapest bottom of the barrel uh, TCP COTS hardware is just not right. They're actually getting into customizing the interconnect because just like HPC, the interconnect is really important. So, you know, Google's not waiting. They're doing custom inner, you know, center fabrics. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, obviously that's evidence that they are modifying the switch to make it more effective. Uh, in this case, uh, I believe that people think that the switch was actually designed to do open flow, which enables them to do better congestion management and traffic grooming. Uh, so it's not that fancy, but, um, but there is a, a lot of discussion of, uh, uh, yeah, open flow, so make uh, hard circuits for QoS guarantees. Um, uh, but then there's the other thing that's happening is that Intel has decided to do an SOC design strategy where they actually move the network interface on board the chip with the CPU. And this is also a big game changer because it, number one, it greatly improves the performance, reduces the overhead, improves the opportunity for high bandwidth interconnects that are, if they're integrated instead of having to go through a PCI bus. So that's a big development just there alone. It reduces your component count. You know, why buy a whole data center full of servers that you plug into the PCI slot exactly the same communication fabric card, you know, a thousand times over? Isn't that kind of a waste of a PCI slot if you could just have it all integrated and eliminate that extra component? Um, reduces power, reduces sources of failure, greatly improves uh, a performance. 20x reduction in software overheads if you can move that interconnect on board. But the other thing that Intel is offering is that if you buy the Intel server chip, you also buy into their custom interconnect fabric that greatly outperforms an off-the-shelf Ethernet. Uh, and it's really hard for somebody to create some PCI bus card that competes with something like that. So you end up getting this lock-in for your internal fabric. You can still plug in around the edge uh, cards that do standard TCP IP Ethernet. In fact, I believe the personality for the Intel thing can switch between standards-based TCP IP and a very custom, high-performance, internally-facing network. But when you buy an Intel chip, you're locked into the Intel fabric. And now everybody else in the industry is panicked about this and is starting to think about migrating their own, you know, custom interconnect onto their server chip if they want to stay in the server market. Because it's such a leg up if you have that. Oh yeah, so here you go. Uh, this, at the time that I wrote this presentation, which was few years, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, Intel had gone on this acquisition spree. They bought QLogic, and that, that gets them InfiniBand. They bought Fulcrum, which is a high performance Ethernet. They bought Cray, uh, not Cray itself. They just bought the interconnect part of Cray. Uh, and then Raj Hazra uh, started going around and saying, we're seeing the role of the fabric far less like a, a, a network in a loosely coupled sense. It's far more like the system bus for the data center and that the data center itself is now an entire integrated organism. Uh, and, and so AMD responded by acquiring C-Micro, which is Atom plus a fabric, but they, they will we'll have to see what they do with that. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, they, they made an announcement the last Hot Chips about their Seattle product, which I think will be the first that, that we'll see out the gate uh, uh, attacking this. So, you know, this is a big ecosystem disruption. HPC used to depend on uh, uh, a commodity chip, an x86 from AMD or from Intel, and then we could mix and match. We could do a full custom interconnect board, uh, and that would be a small, you know, and we could afford to do that, and we could mix and match with our server chips. Now they're saying if you buy Intel, you're buying the Intel fabric. If you buy AMD, you're going to buy the AMD fabric. Um, this, this is, if, if you're a CPU vendor and you want to play in data centers, that NIC has to be on board the CPU chip, but it really disrupts the way we think about supercomputers and about designing data centers, both HPC and warehouse scale computing. So again, going back to this, you know, our old conception of the warehouse scale computing data center design point 
is nearly 100% standard TCP IP inside and out. 90% of your traffic's going through your DMZ, which is your external router connection. What it's moving towards, the new conception, is your data mining, processing, big data, is got 80% internally facing traffic. So low overhead, high bandwidth, semi-custom internal interconnect, especially if you use Intel's onboard you know, network stuff. And then you've got your crunchy TCP IP exterior. And that happens to be exactly the same way that we design our HPC systems. We have full custom in the interior, and then we have some border nodes that, that are able to saturate our trunk line for the exterior. And who the hell cares that the actual protocol of the interior is different than the standard? As long as the API looks the same, it's fine. And so they can virtualize that you're actually doing TCP messaging in the interior, but it bypasses all of the old hardware, it bypasses all of the old OS stack. Here's the thing from, uh, so this is from my friend uh, Satoshi Matsuoka from uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology. Uh, you know, this is uh, the, the, the uh, Cisco uh, global IP traffic. Uh, uh, this is their projection. So this was a 2014 data point uh, and they're projecting out. Uh, our new system has four times uh, the internal uh, bandwidth of the some total aggregate uh, uh, transcontinental uh, IP traffic. Petabytes, right? Yes. Yeah. This is total. Uh, this was no. This is yeah. Um, they, this projection was uh, they're doing some sort of three-point extrapolation because this was a. Uh, it, this was either end of 2013 or beginning of 2014 that this came out, and they're extrapolating from their 2011 and 2012 numbers, obviously. Uh, but so 2014, 15, and 16 are kind of bogus. Um, but uh, uh, this is their projected traffic, projected growth rates, and if you just look at their projection for 15, uh, you know, our machine has uh, uh, about a terabyte per second uh, uh, backbone, and that's only a partial uh, a bisection, and that's only partially configured. There's other machines that have even higher than that. So, anyways, uh, so going back to the convergence requirements, here's the old thing where I was saying that things were diverged. So the lowest cost off-the-shelf Ethernet gear, well. That is changing, or is, or is in the process of changing. External versus internal, their internal focused traffic is no longer a source of divergence in the requirements between what they need for warehouse scale computing and what we need for HPC. They need low overhead, high bandwidth, uh, uh, just, just like we do. They have to deal with traffic grooming and contention now. The open flow switches from Google provide evidence that that's become an important issue for them. Uh, the only things that are not being addressed and that for which I see no impetus to change for warehouse scale computing is addressing the performance variation and addressing resilience. The apps on these warehouse scale computing devices are inherently resilient. The Ethernet's a wild, wild west. You have to build a lot of bulletproofing and resilience into the apps. We have not done this in HPC. One processor in the entire system goes out, it wipes out the entire app that touched that processor. So just one thing goes wrong, you take down the entire app. Uh, performance variation, uh, so they need lower overhead for the small messages, but they'll tolerate that message being delivered at a wide span of, of delivery times. And I don't, just don't see why that there, there, there would be impetus to change that, especially when they've architected their software environment to tolerate these diversity of latencies. So, you know, this, this leads to the question, well, okay, so those last two things we're kind of different on, but we could work on the other parts of the fabric, and there's a lot of discussion of, um, at this point in time, you know, the, the active optical cables or just the, op the optical cabling itself is ridiculously expensive. Transceivers are expensive. For the bandwidth parts of this, we have an obvious place to work together. 
uh, we should probably be using the same transceivers. We should probably be coming up with standards for the cabling technology that could be used between us that are different than Ethernet RJ45s because the Ethernet standards committee is just too slow. Um, and, and too expensive. It's, it's designed for more rugged environment that you see, than you, what you see inside of a data center. Uh, the second thing that we can work on is probably the, um, the protocol design, the layer one, um, you know, the physical layer and, you know, your layer one, layer two, the, the routing protocols. We could probably work together on that. Um, but then the things that we can't really have impetus to work on, we have to actually examine in the HPC space. Maybe we're doing something wrong. Maybe we need to actually come into the middle to where the, the data centers are. And the first thing is our bulk synchronous distributed memory proto protocol, uh, I mean, uh, uh, programming environment. This is our execution model is called communicating sequential processes. Uh, and so you run a copy of the same program in every node, but each one is numbered with a different MPI rank or whatnot, and then they are, use that MPI rank to communicate with each other, but it's fundamentally bulk synchronous. Um, we've evolved this model over two decades, and we've changed all of our, not, not just our code, but the actual fundamental algorithms are designed so that there's as little as possible load imbalance incurred by the algorithm. Uh, and so we've edited out uh, pretty much anything that would not fit into the bulk synchronous model. Changing that doesn't just require a change in software, it requires a change in the mathematics that we've used and that we've developed over these years. So this will be a tall order, but it's something we need to examine as to whether or not the uh, CSP model is sensible to carry forward. It may be that it's the inevitable path for HPC and for uh, simulation programs to, uh, to, to address this challenge and go to a more data flow type of a model. Second is, uh, and so it's due diligence that we should examine alternative execution models for HPC because things, for, there, there are alternatives that exist. There's Swarm, HPX, Charm. These are existing communication and execution libraries that are able to tolerate uh, performance diversity. So they could run well in a cloud, but moreover they're able to tolerate failure. Uh, any object in Charm can be recovered from state from objects that are running in other nodes of the system. So if something fails, it can, uh, it can actually recover that state and then relaunch it on a different node. It's very tolerant of failure. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're trying to, but, but before we tell everybody this is what you got to do, we're creating models and simulations of how future be systems might behave and how these kind of new programming environments may perform uh, to determine whether or not we can actually, it, it's productive for us to make this conversion. Uh, so, you know, asynchronous execution models, they are very much aligned with the cloud data center software challenge. Uh, we have to find out, though, if the value proposition would really play out for future systems. Is Charm the product of Illinois? Yes, that's the one. Problem with Charm is it was designed for um, molecular dynamics codes, and so it has these properties, but its communication model is very inefficient, unfortunately. Uh, in, in, in comparison to MPI, and it has a lot of overheads for scheduling small pieces of work. Uh, fortunately for them, NAMD, which is the primary use of it, is uh, got very compute intensive, so that it's fine. The overheads are amortized by Charm. The really the big question, but but when you use it for other codes that communicate more frequently, then it's just like the EC2 cloud. You know, it start it falls behind. Uh, MPI in terms of performance. So applications people are extremely practical people. They're like, well, it's slower. I'm not going to use that. Uh, we have to ask the question, but will it be slower in the future? And so I, as a computer scientist, am trying to set up the experiment to say, but when will this? When will it be the other way around? Because it can take years for us to change our software infrastructure if we believe that that's the future. It's possible that the overheads will that the benefits will always uh, be less than the overheads that would be incurred from doing that model but we we have to we have to exit find out is there anything else but NAMD written in charm they've ported a number of other codes but i'm going to step 
carefully in this because I'm being recorded here, I would say that often the performance is done relative to itself in a bulk synchronous form rather than a tuned MPI implementation, which causes us to say, wow, that's scalable, but it's still slower than MPI. So uh, one of the issues, uh, the difficulties for any of these is that there's actually a, there's a mathematical theory behind this that says that if you have a bulk synchronous code and it's efficient, it's load balanced, there's no situation where doing a dynamically scheduled, so these guys are talking about uh, runtime dynamic scheduling system for Charm uh, so that it can accommodate load imbalances very quickly. If your stuff is already load balanced, all that you get when you go to a full dynamic scheduling system is you've added overhead, but it won't perform any better because there's no load imbalance. <coughs> so if all of your software algorithms have been designed to not have load imbalances, and your hardware, as hardware currently is today, if it's not EC2, is also relatively uh, equal performance for all the components, it's damn near impossible to demonstrate a benefit from any of these other models. So what we're creating is a modeling system that artificially inserts noise according to a, a model of you know, Gaussian process model so that we can say at what point will the noise be too much for a bulk synchronous model to tolerate and that the overheads incurred by Charm, HPX, or Swarm are, are, um, can be tolerated because the benefit in terms of load balancing exceeds the cost of the overheads. Yeah. But we're moving to heterogeneous systems. Right, but, but you, the, your uh, programmers have been told this story before, and anybody who bid on it rewrote their code, it was slower, and it didn't happen. So they're, they're, they, don't, they don't trust, there, there's a certain amount of trust. <laughs> so, so there's heterogeneity in, in yeah. what is doing the computation, right? Yeah. Well, and right. So when you have different compute fabrics that have different characteristics, it seems like this. Yeah, well, again, it going to be, and they would like for us, the people who were designing the infrastructure, the, the apps people, again, very practical minded, focused on the science, they, you know, uh, infrastructure, they don't get any papers out of that. They need a convincing case that, that, that the future, that it's unavoidable, that, that, that heterogeneity is going to be there. And they need to know how soon or far away that is. And uh, it's. Just point to the GPUs in the top. Oh, you mean that kind of heterogeneity? Oh, yeah. Um, that's, that's easier because you can actually statically schedule work partition work between a GPU and a CPU and then you don't incur those overheads and it's still a bulk synchronous model. So that, that one we, 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 we uh, have passed through that where people said we have to do dynamic scheduling and then people said well, actually once you know how fast the GPU is relative to the CPU you only have to set the, the coefficient, the dial for the work partition once and well, we're willing to do that. So static scheduling still wins, bulk synchronous still wins. Uh, we need the case that we're looking for is the dynamic scheduling case. That's when you get unexpected noise, like the noise that you see in an EC2. Yeah, there's also the fact that the workload are very homogeneous in what you're doing. Yeah. Because if you're doing something like an MPEG4 decoding, it's mm -hmm. very interesting uh, problem because you have a very serial, uh, very length decoding, and then you have right. a parallel uh, Correct. Uh, motion. So right. it's two workloads in a single application. Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, again, uh, I have to point out, 30 years of editing, there are many choices that you can make in the math and the algorithms for doing, conducting these simulations. Algorithms that were inherently unbalanced got edited out. Uh, we, and, and there's no implementations of those exist, only papers about them. Uh, converting from paper back into code again for algorithms that are inherently not load balanced but would work better in the system might be another 30 years at the end of the day. Yeah, it's interesting too because the fact is what has been edited out is maybe something that is not researched anymore or 
it's it's like it's <laughs> it's like we could not solve this problem, so we are not looking at them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, it's the, the this is the curious thing with standing between being CTO at NERSC, where you got all the domain scientists and sitting in the CS research side. Uh, in CS research, you don't really, uh, people's codes are really messy, messy things. They're written Fortran or all sorts of weird languages, and well, not no, mostly Fortran, and, and, and they're really messy. They've accumulated years of cruft, and you don't get any brownie points when you submit your paper that you actually converted a real code, uh, you get just as many points and just as much opportunity to publish by doing a simplified version of that code that just implements the FFT or something, and you can call it, call it a day. For the apps guys, it's the other way around. They get no brownie points for going to an advanced programming language. You know, if uh, the only thing they get points for is that their simulation worked and it gave them some new insight into the physics, uh, you have to be very convincing that the extra e effort, which is overhead for them, uh, will pay off in terms of more physics results. In the past, people who have offered new, newer programming models, say like, let's take C++ as an example. I remember uh, a postdoc coming in breathlessly to declare that we didn't need to use Fortran anymore. We could use C++ because look, you can do complex numbers. And we said, oh really? And so it showed us and then we ran it on the machine and it was 10 times slower. Uh, and, and, and we're like, no, I guess we're not going to be doing that. <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, very practical minded. Uh, they will not change for 10 to 15 percent. They will change for 10x. That's the magic number. If you get 10x, damn well they will change for it. They, they, we've done it before. We did it when, the, when they went from vector to cluster. I remember at the beginning of that curve, uh, a lot of the apps people said, this is stupid, you know, the, just the, the, this damn Cray. Oh, Cray 1 has an 80 megahertz processor, and you're telling me to go to this thing that runs at 16 megahertz? You nuts? Uh, and 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 then then as the clock rates for the desktop machines caught up, and in addition you had thousands of nodes in them, and the Cray did not improve its clock rate and did not have thousands of nodes. They saw that 10x and they went for it. And so this this could happen again, but we're not we we haven't demonstrated that the, a 10x advantage to this this asynchronous stuff yet. And yeah, that's a, that's, I mean it's because if we talk about the cloud, yeah. it might not be a 10x advantage in performance, but the yeah. cloud gives you a 10x advantage in productivity. Meaning that if I'm a research a yeah. scientist that doesn't have access to this kind of machine, mm -hmm. I can still like be able to get all these dynamic algorithm. And it takes longer, but I, I can pay a little bit to Amazon and get it. Possibly, but anybody in DOE can get an account on the DOE HPC system, and anybody in NSF can apply for an account. They don't. It's it's not too secret the way they parcel out the time for these machines, uh, and. Sure. So if you're a private researcher, I mean, think, you, you should actually think of the DOE supercomputing centers as sort of a cloud. You know, you, you, buy, you buy more and more and more and you operate a larger, if you operate a cluster in the closet, the overheads are pretty substantial. You have to burn half a postdoc to maintain the stupid thing. Uh, uh, you, you know, you have to go through all the process of buying it, and it's just as, you know, there's a lot of paperwork to buy the thing, and it sits idle most of the time in the closet. If you go to, to a supercomputing center, you're time sharing with thousands of users. So the thing's 95% busy all of the time. You have the, if you run a small cluster, it takes one sysadmin. You run a cluster that's 10 times larger, it's two sysadmins. Uh, but you get the apex of your, your cost effectiveness advantage once you get to like a 20,000 square foot system. It's really hard to squeeze more cost effectiveness out of the system once you get to that scale. And there isn't much cost margin in the guys that are selling the clusters to us. They're at like 8 to 12% margins. So even if you buy in huge volumes, you know, you, you're not going to squeeze much more out of Cray or, or Dell or whatever. That's, uh, I mean, exactly yeah. like the argument you're making is the same argument Amazon makes. Yeah. Have people who 
to the cloud. Right. It just makes a lot of sense. Right. Yeah, and, and so the key thing that we're saying with our, the supercomputing centers is that at the moment we offer very efficient fabric. So your, your average performance, so they're not, their cost is going to be about the same, uh, though you don't see any of the cost. We don't charge any of our users. Uh, and, uh, and so in terms of cost effectiveness, it's about the same, but in terms of performance, it's a gain. So if you're DOE, you know that you're probably going to, invest in the system that was designed for the HPC rather than taking that. So those same dollars, which are, it's a zero sum game with the dollars and investing it into the, uh, in, into the cloud. Uh, that could change, but that's kind of the way that the fabrics are still diverged and the fact that the HPC workload is still can't tolerate some of the features of the cloud is, is problematic. So, yeah. Also, I, I, I have to say, when I was in the cloud, it was a real pain in the ass building MPI and the parallel file system and stuff, too. So I kind of like that to be pre-done for me. Have you tried it recently? <laughs> have I tried in the... Words, have you tried this experiment you did in 2009? Has it been duplicated with even more modern... Uh, yes. Actually, so I've gotten out of this because I'm now a department head. I'm not useful for anything. Uh, but uh, uh, we actually have um, uh, Lavanya Ramakrishnan uh, continues to do work in the cloud. Their reasoning for going into the cloud is that some of the uh, science groups that they do work with, their funding model, there's, there's colors of money, and they, don't, they can't operate a data center. They can't give money to us to operate something on their behalf. Uh, and if you don't, if, if those are the two things, then you have to operate in the cloud, you know, because if, if no, you know, and so those guys are being served by this. And so she sets up workflows that operate in, in the EC2 cloud. And they're using an instance now that has InfiniBand for the interconnect, but there's, hmm? It's, they call it something else. It's, it's Amazon, but it's, it's not EC2. It's, it's some new instance that they have. It's a much smaller resource. Huh? They already have InfiniBand on Amazon. They have some InfiniBand. Yeah, just uh, it's very special. That. Yeah, I heard that like about a year ago. Yeah, it's been around, and they've been trying to sell it to like NIH and stuff like that. But it's still a lot more expensive per performance in comparison to uh, operating at a supercomputing center. But if you can't operate a supercomputing center and you can't get time at one, it's definitely a democratizing technology. Oh, yeah, I got some, uh, I just, uh, uh, let's see here, make the cloud safe for HPC. Uh, so you meet, meet, meet the cloud halfway by redesigning to tolerate asynchrony and faults. Uh, this is experimentations with these asynchronous scheduling things. And we create a great uh, noise model so we can say how much, if we go to this model uh, and redesign the algorithm so it really fits well, how much additional noise can we tolerate? Can we tolerate the amount of noise that we're seeing in a cloud? So it's a dialable noise model so we can uh, set up different testing scenarios. Uh, and ask the question of, you know, do we move closer to the cloud or does the cloud need to move closer to us? Um, one of the issues that we see is just basic things like Poisson solvers, which are pervasive in a lot of our codes, currently create an implicit synchronization point. So all that asynchrony you have, suddenly you hit the end of the Poisson solve and you, everybody has to join a reduction operation at the end of the Poisson solve and you lose all the asynchrony all in one fell swoop. And uh, we talked to the mathematicians uh, and we said asynchronous Poisson solve. And they're like, what? You know, that just kind of blows their mind, uh, the, the, the concept. So um, uh, we, they actually have come up with some ideas. I don't know if they work yet, but they, they do now have some ideas. Uh, but it just requires, it's not simply porting your software to a different API for communication. You know, Converting it to charm plus plus, not the answer. You have to reformulate the math. That's, mathematicians don't work that fast. Uh, yeah, so we spent you know, 20 years rewriting our algorithms to eliminate non-bulk synchronous behavior. Now we're saying, no, actually we want bulk, you know, uh, <laughs> asynchrony. Uh, it's it's going to be uh, hard, but the potential benefits are substantial, so we're still working on it. Uh, let's see here, uh, integrated Nix, yeah, big hardware realignment. So it used to be it was all about TCP and uh, off the shelf. Now they're looking at high performance custom nets in warehouse scale computing. 
a lot of opportunities for convergence. Uh, and the server CPU vendors are responding with integrated NICs that have custom fabrics associated with them. Uh, the implication is that there's a lot more alignment than there's ever been before. We should take advantage of as much of that as we can get. And that's it. Hmm. Yeah, oh, and this is an, another example code, but we'll forget about that. All right, so thank you. <laughs>